I have to just focus on the type of world that we want. That's really my aim is to talk about the plant-based movement, to talk about how healthy and inviting it can be, how good it feels, because it does feel good. A lot of people think that when you go vegan, you know, your life's going to be really angry and sad and you're not going to be healthy. That's just not true. Like, <laughs> we're all thriving vegans and I speak to thriving vegans every day, whether on the podcast or just, you know, there's lots of vegan events here on the coast and everyone's healthy and happy and loves their lives and it's that as you said taking the blinders off it's just saying hey there's a, there's another world out here and we'd love for you to join us but no pressure welcome to the power plant body podcast my name is taylor and this show is focused on self-development i found in my own life as well as the lives of my clients that i've worked with that it's human nature to focus on goals in one area of life or maybe two areas of life if you're lucky to the detriment of the other areas of your life. For this reason, there's a tool that I use with my clients called the Goal Wheel that is specifically designed to shed light on how you might be preventing yourself from living the fullest life possible. In a nutshell, the Goal Wheel is a circle drawn on a piece of paper that's been divided into eight quadrants. The eight quadrants are family and friends, romance, fun and recreation, health and fitness, finances, personal growth and spirituality, career, and physical environment. Basically, you give yourself a score between one and 10 for each of these areas of your life, and that allows you to see where you're excelling and putting your attention, but it also shows you the areas of your life that you're currently neglecting. The areas of life that we neglect are often the areas that we need to work on the most, and that's exactly why I started this podcast, to share insights from teachers who are experts in one or more of these areas of the goal wheel. Each interview is meant to inspire you to take action in one of those areas so that you can live a more fulfilled and balanced life. To get your hands on a free copy of the Goal Wheel PDF so that you can use it to create meaningful goals and take steps to achieve them, head over to powerplantbody.com forward slash free dash tools. You'll find a bunch of other free tools and resources there as well. I was actually inspired to start this podcast after Chloe reached out to me asking me if I'd be on hers. Chloe Garnum is the host of the Planty Potty podcast. That's at Planty Potty, P-L-A-N-T-Y-P-O-D-I-E on Instagram, where she interviews well-known vegan advocates like doctors, fitness influencers, and recipe creators. Chloe grew up on a farm in New Zealand, so her story of how she became vegan is definitely an interesting one. In our conversation, Chloe shares how her switch to a vegan diet improves her health and enjoyment of life drastically. I love Chloe's approach because she takes a compassionate, non-judgmental, curious stance that can't help but be inviting to people who are also curious about their food choices. One last note, right before publishing this episode, Chloe uploaded a blog post to Medium titled How I Saved Money by Going Vegan, which I strongly encourage you to check out if you're looking to eat more healthy and spend a little bit less money. After listening to our conversation, head over to Chloe's podcast, The Plancy Potty, so you can check out her eye-opening and inspiring conversations with some of the best people for resources and information regarding the vegan diet. So without any further delay, I bring you my conversation with Chloe Garnum. Well, Chloe, I appreciate you being on the podcast. And maybe before we get started, you were the inspiration to me to start up my podcast not so long ago because you had me on yours, which is the Planty Potty podcast. And uh, uh, am I saying that right? Right. Planty Potty? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for being Um, on the show and thank you for having me on your show. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, I'm looking forward to learning more about you and what inspired you to start it. Um, so I just yeah. invite you to uh, let me and the listeners know who you are and what you're doing. Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, I'm from New Zealand originally. I live here in the Gold Coast. I've lived in a few mm-hmm. different countries until um, moving here eventually, but I wanted like a really um, sunny, almost tropical lifestyle. So that was kind of my my dream life. So I'm kind of living that now. And I do run the Planty Potty. It's almost like a, I think of it almost like a social enterprise or just like a, a project that I do, um, obviously not for any profit, but just because I'm extremely passionate about both the plant-based and the vegan movement. Um, And I think that those those movements, although they're, I mean, they're slightly separate, they're kind of one and the same thing. And they're so important for the health of our planet, for obviously the animals that live on our planet, but also our own human health. Um, 
And the fourth thing that's come up recently is, you know, COVID-19 and these various pandemics that arise through, um, you know, that come from animals and through animal Mm -hmm. agriculture. So I think having those four pillars and having that in mind and thinking about the type of planet that I want to live on, it's been so important to to do something. And I think something's better than nothing. And anything that we do counts, right? Like just choosing oat milk at the supermarket is counts. But I really wanted to um, see how I could make an impact. So that's kind of, you know, what I do. And then outside of that, I, um, I run my own business. So I'm essentially a freelance copywriter. And that's um, what I do here on the coast. That's a bit of an intro anyway. <laughs> cool. Well, I'd love to learn more about the podcast and the message that you're getting across mm. in that podcast with the guests that you have on. But maybe we could start with how you got into this passion that you have mm. about plant-based living and, and the vegan movement. What was life like before mm. the vegan Chloe? Like, where were you there? And then what was the inciting event? What kicked off this... this uh, the shift for you? Mm. Well, physically speaking, I was living in um, Melbourne at the time and I was working for a financial company. And I, um, although I had like a very stress-free job and it was a pretty (laughs) sweet gig that I had at the time, I had such poor health, but not poor health in the way that you would you know, it's not like I couldn't get out of bed or that I was chronically in pain or anything like that, but I just had such low energy. On the weekends, I would just want to, you know, my now husband would be like, oh, you know, let's go do this, let's go do that. And I would be sort of keen to do those things in the morning, but then in the afternoon, I would need to go to bed and lie down. And although I wasn't sleeping, I was just always tired. I had... um so to kind of go back and, and talk about the, the health stuff, because it kind of, <laughs> it all starts years ago. So when I was at university, um, in my first year, I was, um, I was studying law at the time. And I just one day had a really, t- re- really terrible stomach pain. And I didn't know what caused it. I had no idea, but I just, you know, just assumed it's one of those things. And basically that terrible stomach pain didn't go away for about two years straight. And so oh in goodness. that... Yeah, yeah. So in that time, I became an expert in, not an expert, I tried to become an expert in my own body and what caused the pain. I kind of became a little bit of like a pin cushion (laughs) because Mm. it was like, go to another doctor and find out, you know, is it this, is it that? So I went through a number of like medical procedures, you know, and I'm a really private person. I was incredibly shy at the time. I'm still relatively shy, but at the time I was so shy. And the whole process was, it was quite debilitating. And it meant that I had to, you know, work in advance for my university studies. And I really had to um, apply myself because I didn't know, you know, I might wake up one day and be like, well, I'm just not getting out of bed today. So yeah, it was a really, really difficult time. And that went on for years. And then eventually I had surgery um, for a, a muscular hip injury is basically what it is. If anyone's heard of the iliozoas muscle, that's basically what the injury was. And it was from years previous from playing both soccer and also um, certain gym exercises that for whatever reason in me had triggered this injury. So I eventually had a hip surgery to, to fix it. But even in the years that followed that, which is probably another maybe four, is it that many years? Four, four years. Um, I still just didn't have the perfect health. I could never go for a run or, you know, my hip might trigger. So although it was better in terms of day-to-day activities, this is getting such a long story, but it all comes together. <laughs> um, but yeah, so... It would, it would trigger health things. And that was happening to me in Melbourne. So I had sort of a low level, like low, low energy. I definitely wasn't thriving. I had started to get a little bit, um, maybe not overweight, but towards overweight. And I um, would occasionally tri- trigger this hip injury. So I just kind of felt like I couldn't really fully exist in the world and, and be happy. So I started researching, um, you know, what's the best diet in the world and what's the best way to live. And I was very curious about all these different things. And I'd been curious about it for years, but I'd never really got to the bottom of it. And that's when I discovered the blue zones. So for anyone Mm -hmm. who doesn't know, the blue zones are places in the world where people live the longest. And they have a number of things that um, are similar. And it's not just diet. But one thing is that they eat predominantly plant-based diets. That blew my mind because I grew up on a farm. You know, I've worked on dairy farms. I grew up on a sheep and cattle farm. I, in my mind, we need, um, you know, dairy, we need meat, we need all of these things. And so it was really shocking to me that these people, although some of them might eat small amounts of these products, 
they weren't a large part of the diet. They were almost like insignificant. And some of the um, people in the Blue Zones are actually vegan. The people who live in Loma Linda, some of those people are vegan. So that proves that you can live to be 100 without all these diseases Mm -hmm. and not eat animal products. So that was really shocking to me. And then I discovered nutritionfacts.org. And that Mm. website changed my life completely. I was like, wow, this is amazing. I sent it to my family after I'd been following it um, for, for some time. But what's really interesting is that was two years before I actually went vegan. And in that time, I did try to... Um, eat a plant-based diet or eat more plants. But I found, and I've now later learned, it's probably something to do with my gut microbiome. And I know that um, Dr. B, I can't exactly remember how to pronounce his name, but you probably know who I'm talking about. From from Nutrition Facts? He's got, Dr. He's Dr. called Dr. Will... Um, he has a book called Fiber Fueled and he has mm. talked a lot about microbiome and why it's important to sort of, I guess, slowly oh, introduce new... Foods. No, it wasn't Barnard. It was Dr. Will. I can't remember his name. It was one called of the Dr. Doctors. B. Yeah, <laughs> one of the plant-based yeah. doctors. And um, yeah. maybe we can put it in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, so um, I was, you know, I started to eat a lot of beans and whole grains, but my stomach didn't like it. So I assumed mm-hmm. it just wasn't for me. But what I didn't realize is that you really need to introduce these things slowly because if you've never eaten beans before, your body's going to get a real shock. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. It, yeah, so it took another two years. But then in that time, I was open to the idea. I started to listen to a number of different podcasts. I listened to a number of different animal activists and I learned about the environmental impact of um, animal agriculture as well. So in those two years, although I was eating a completely animal-based diet, animal products with almost every meal, I was conscious of the fact that it was possible to not do that. And eventually Mm. I made the shift when my health just continued to get worse and worse, I'd say. Like just my energy was just lower and lower. And um, so I suppose that was the the spin-off point to, to starting that new lifestyle. And it sounds like you were, before those two years, I can't imagine mm. having a painful stomachache and no mm. energy for two years, but it sounds <laughs> like from before those two years, you injured yourself from an active lifestyle. It sounds like you were active before this and played soccer and whatnot. Am I getting that right? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I remember when I was at school, I mean, I was never a fit person. <laughs> so um, I was, you know, pretty slow in my class and I always like didn't, like PE, but I liked individual, um, activities. So I used to run a lot after school. I, um, as you, yeah, I played soccer. That was the only team sport that I actually really enjoyed. And, um, yeah. And I went to the gym a lot as well, particularly when in my sort of first year of university or yeah, first year of university, I went to the gym a lot. So yes, I loved exercising. I loved that feeling of being really puffed, particularly cardio, um, workouts, but I also did some weights. So yeah, you're right. And then, when that stomach pain started, I didn't know that I'd injured myself, but it, mm-hmm. it's a funny um, injury. The muscle has a nickname, which is the hidden culprit. And many people who get this injury, they don't know they have it because it presents as stomach pain. So you kind of go through all the other more serious things before mm-hmm. you can kind of go, okay, I'm, you know, it's this particular muscle. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, you said the iliopsoas, right? Mm, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, so you went through that whole process and eventually got into adopting a plant-based a vegan life. And now mm. you have a podcast and yeah. you interview people and mm. tout the benefits of a plant-based life. As you mm. said, it checks all these boxes. You know, it's good for the environment. It's good for um, expressing your compassion towards animals. It's good for your health. Yeah. What was the What was the inciting moment there? When did you... When did you start to take all of this that was happening in your life and realize that you wanted to externalize it and share it with the people around you? Well, I suppose it was how much my life changed. Um, And I didn't really expect it to. I mean, I had read so much by this point. So I expected there to be, you know, some positive changes in my life. And I, I wasn't particularly, you know, motivated by weight loss, but I thought I probably would um, lose some weight. And I hoped that I might have better energy. Um, but the transformation was so big that I fixed problems that I didn't even know I had. For example, um, I had insane food cravings, but I didn't know that that wasn't normal. (laughs) So I would sit at work and think about food from like 
lunchtime onwards because my lunch didn't fill me. So I'd wake up, feel fine. And then I, you know, my breakfast, actually, to be fair, I did have a plant-based breakfast at that time anyway. I'd already started having like a smoothie with oats and it was pretty filling. So that would keep me pretty satiated till lunchtime. But then my lunch was probably a salad with like chicken and feta cheese or something. It just was not filling me up at all. But I didn't know that because I was eating the amount that I saw other people eat. I thought that was a normal Mm -hmm. amount to eat. And I was like obsessed with food. I would like fantasize about the idea of like chocolate bars being healthy, which is like so crazy to me now. I mean, I don't even, I can't even even imagine. I mean, I eat like some dark chocolate, but I can't imagine like eating a chocolate bar. It's just so funny to me now, but I was obsessed with food, but I thought that was normal. So I was having these insane food cravings and I presume um, that was because I just wasn't, um, I just wasn't full. I just wasn't eating enough fiber and I wasn't getting the nutrients that I needed and my body was just like, I need more. But unfortunately my body was craving like those really calorie dense foods. And normally I wouldn't give into the craving, but, but sometimes I did because I was just like, I need to eat something. But of course it was something that was so poor for my health. Um, so things like this started to change where I would eat a meal and feel full until the next meal, or maybe I'd have a snack, but I'd just have a piece of fruit. I'd like, that was amazing to me. So that was so transformative. I did start to lose weight, not rapidly, but actually really gradually over time. Um, and what else happened? I I started to wake up feeling filled with energy, which is just like, You know, now I believe that having gone gone through all of that, you know, I kind of know that health is our greatest wealth. Like we can have all the money in the world and all the things, but if you don't wake up feeling invigorated for the day, it's really difficult to it's really difficult to enjoy your life, particularly yeah, if you're if you're having like an afternoon slump or whatever. So yeah, I started to feel so good. So I guess the natural inclination is when you feel so good. And also I suppose motivated by the the animal suffering which became more present in my mind as I went down the plant-based track so I I eased myself in as saying I'll probably do 80 or 90 percent plant-based and then you know when I'm out I'll just eat whatever I want but it was really the animal ethics that made me realize that if I don't need these products then this is like crazy what happens to them and then also the environmental side of things you know we want to live on a uh, a healthy planet, a planet that can sustain us and everything else, every other living being that's on the planet. So all of those things put together really inspired me to start something, but it did take me quite a while. So I suppose I was, you know, almost two years vegan. I'm probably getting near two and a half years vegan now, but at that time, probably about two, uh, getting near two. And I finally felt like yeah, podcasting. I, I love people and I love connecting with people. And even though I'm an introvert, like one-on-one conversations are really inspiring to me. So other people telling their stories. And I suppose that's the way that I, I learned so much is through, um, through some podcasts and interviews on YouTube and whatnot. So I, I just wanted to keep spreading that message. And I would love for other people's lives to be transformed through in the same way that, that I did, because you know, why wouldn't you want everyone to, to feel like you do? Um, so not in a forceful way, but in a way that I feel like everyone should be able to access this information. And then from there, you know, they can make their own decisions about what's best for them. Yeah. And you said it best. Health is your greatest wealth, right? Um, yeah. Something else that you said, I, I think is really relevant for a lot of people is healing things that you didn't even realize you were suffering from. Mm-hmm. And when you said waking up every morning with energy, I think a lot of people don't realize that that's possible. You can wake up mm-hmm. and you don't have to go and hammer back a coffee right away. You can, you can wake mm-hmm. up and feel refreshed from a good sleep and vitalized for the morning. And if you want to have a coffee a little later, that's fine. I do. I don't think I ever miss a day without coffee. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, the idea that you... Um, your health is your greatest wealth and there are likely things that you're experiencing on a day-to-day basis that are holding you back. You're not even realizing the impact that it has on your life. Um, to introduce a healthier lifestyle, uh, can open up a a whole new world for you as far as the experiences that you're able to enjoy. Oh, totally. Like it it is like a whole new world. That's what it feels like. And Mm. it's that, that feeling of 
like so many people who come on the podcast say that they felt like they'd been lied to and oftentimes they've seen a documentary or um, a book or something along those lines and they're like wow I just never knew this and I think that's the whole thing about you know why I'm podcasting and why anyone you know does this is just just like that access to information like we all deserve to be able to hear this and and know this and as you said like know it's possible to wake up feeling full of energy because I honestly just thought I was a low energy person I remember I had discussions with people about this and they were like yeah I'm a really low energy person I was like oh me too yeah I need like lots of rest I need alone time it's because I'm an introvert it's like I'm an introvert which means I need time alone but it doesn't mean I need time like in bed in the day like I would never (laughs) get in bed in the day anymore unless like I don't know I just was like have taken a lie down but I I would never need to anymore um but the other thing with that is like I get enough sleep and I think the plant-based diet has helped me to get enough sleep I go to bed really early I, I wake up early so I but I get like a really deep sleep um I wasn't a bad sleeper before but I certainly sleep more deeply and like disturbances don't don't bother me as much so um that helps to then wake up and feel for so it's like a flow on effect it kind of affects every way of your life and as you said like you don't even know where you could improve because you just assume mm. that how you feel is normal mm-hmm. so these conversations that you're having on your podcast you interview people and you just said it just a moment ago um that they felt like they are a lot of people bring up the fact that they felt like they were being lied to. Mm. What are in your conversations with, with the people that you've had on your podcast, what are some of mm. the, what are some of the insights that you've, um, that you've made or some of the aha moments that they've had? What are some of the, the through lines that you've seen in everybody's story? Well, I think, um, learning about the health aspect is quite big for people. So if maybe they've stumbled across nutritionfacts.org, um, or another book by a plant-based doctor or a talk. I, n- I know some people on the podcast had actually been to see Dr. Esselstyn in person. I was so jealous. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be amazing. But yeah, he was on the podcast, which was really cool. Um, so I think the, the plant-based side of things for, I'm trying to think, most people that have been on the podcast, I would say, came through it through the, the, the health side of things. But in terms of the feeling of being lied to, and I suppose that comes into it because they think like, wow, the dairy industry is so powerful that they can convince all of these people that they need calcium from dairy, where (laughs) in actual fact, that's not true. And um, to convince like, you know, the human species that they need to drink milk from another species, you know, not only as a child, but as an adult, (laughs) you know, like we're the only mammals (laughs) on the planet that do this. And the majority of people on the planet are lactose intolerant for good reason, Mm -hmm. because you know, every mammal weans around the age of two, but you know, the dairy industry is such a good example of like where people feel like they've been lied to. And oftentimes it comes into the ethics side because they see, um, you know, the, the calf being, so the mother carries the calf for nine months. So the same period as a, as a human. And then on the day or the day after that she gives birth, the calf gets taken away and when people see videos of that happening and see the um, the upset for that cow, you know, and they and people can't help but think that calves are cute. They are so so cute. So oh, I yeah, think they're adorable. That, they're like puppies. Yeah, they are. They're, they're exactly like puppies. They're so yeah. gorgeous. And yeah, I think when people see that, they go, "Wow, I've really been lied to," because that they don't have a picture of that on the milk carton. They have mm. like a picture of a, a happy cow in a grassy field. Well, yeah. in many countries, that's not the case. So where I grew up in New Zealand, it is the case that the, the cows are out on grassy paddocks, but their cows are still taken from them. But in many countries in the world, they simply don't have the space for that. So they're not in a grassy paddock. They're in like a, you know, undercover in one, yeah. I can't think what the word is, but in like a stall. Oh, what was that? Uh, confined, agri- yeah. uh, confined animal feeding operation, I think it's called. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it, yeah. exactly. Um, so I think that's when they feel like they've been lied to and then, yeah, learning more about the ethics. And I think for often people, they might witness, um, a small part of, you know, what happens in a slaughterhouse or, you know, even like the egg industry, a lot of people know about the hens and that they're kept in very, very small cages. But, um, for me and for so many people, we all bought free range because we were like, well, that's the positive yeah. choice and again it's like I the know. chickens out in the 
the you know, it's got this big barn to walk around, mm-hmm. and then it goes outside and everything's happening. You just take its egg. I mean, what's the big deal? But people don't realize yeah. that in order for that to happen, you have to kill chicks. And, well, you don't have to, yeah. but this is what they do in the industry. And they kill all of the male chicks. And they're killed through not very nice means. Um, so, you know, most people, for example, like wouldn't be able to, if you had a, like a plate in front of a typical omnivore, and you gave them a, an egg, so they had like an eggs, eggs benedict or something, and mm-hmm. um, you gave them like a male chick, and you're like, well, in order to do this, you're going to have to kill the chick, but then you can eat the meal and enjoy it. Now, I reckon most, like, most people on the planet are not going to do that. Sure, some people will. Mm-hmm. Some people work in slaughterhouses, so they have to do this every day. But mm-hmm. most people aren't going to do that, and I think it's just when they realize like, oh, okay, so my choice to do this means this, and they never knew that, and we're all shielded from it. So a lot of houses don't have glass walls, as there's like a famous saying, I can't remember who said it. And, um, you know, if slaughterhouses had glass walls, then everyone would be vegan. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that's the saying, or maybe vegetarian, I can't remember. But they're always out of, you know, urban areas. They're out in rural areas, so you can't um, see them. You can't smell how bad they smell. And you don't Mm. really see it. And you assume that it happens in other countries. I think oftentimes you think, oh, well, that happens in, like, America. That doesn't happen here. Um, Well, it happens in every country. (laughs) If you've got animal products, there are slaughterhouses Mm. and there are factory farms. So I think that's where most people realise. And then the environmental side of things um, is quite impactful for people too. But I find that that's the least impactful because I think um, the health and the ethics are really powerful for people when they discover Mm -hmm. the information yeah the the interesting thing about the environment one um for me is is i can totally understand for a number of reasons why the environment side of things isn't as it's not the leading edge for a lot of people Mm. because for one it's um the environmental impact although we're possibly getting closer and closer to it is still Mm. in the future Right. Whereas Mm. health and animal welfare are instantaneous. You can do something about it and see the impact right away. Um, But the other thing, too, is that the environmental side of things is often uh, it's we think of it as just oh, just a bunch of cows farting and releasing methane. That's bad Mm -hmm. for the environment. Or, uh, you know, if you take it a step beyond that, it's oh, it's the it's the um, the land being used, you know, they take up an awful lot of land. But the impact is so mm. crazy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like if you look at the, if you look at the, you know, the dead zones and the oceans from the runoff from rivers that uh, have, like you were talking about those CAFOs, out of sight, out of sight, out of mind. Except for mm. if you're in a town close to a CAFO, mm. you can be guaranteed that you smell it, and mm. likely there's, um, you know, contamination in your water supply if you have a local water supply. Uh, you know, if there's runoff from the, mm. if there's a pig farm, if you've ever seen those giant, yeah. anyways, it's real gross, yeah. but, oh, yeah. <laughs> but the yeah. environmental impact is, is, uh, it's crazy. If you look into it, like act- mm. actually psychotic and, um, I don't know. It's just, it's just a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to think of something that's so impactful on a global scale. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you say, you feel like you've been lied to, mm. um, that is, is kind of just under the, the radar for a lot of people, for most people. Oh, totally. Yeah, the environmental side, um, it's actually a really good point that you make that it is in the future. So it's almost like having to imagine a future planet, whereas you say like these like atrocities that happen to animals and our own health, we can just see it in the present moment. So mm-hmm. I think that's, yeah, that's a really good point. That's probably why. Um, but as you say, the, the environmental side is so huge and it's well beyond um like co2 you know it's like water use deforestation i believe it's the leading like animal agriculture is the leading cause of species um declinement and um a whole lot of other things i don't have the stats on the top of my head but i know that cowspiracy is such a good documentary it's kind of like a good jumping off point in terms of just understanding what the impact is but like you know even the un say that a vegan diet is much more environmentally friendly. So we have these Mm. big organizations who are saying, Mm. yes, it's better for the environment. But then you have like the American Dietetic Association, which is the largest nutritional association, saying a vegan diet is helpful, you know, as long as it's well-planned, which 
with you know with well on you know we're generally talking about whole food plant-based living we're not talking about like living off oreos or anything mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. i mean that'd be nice but that would be nice <laughs> i know that's like my um kryptonite it's like oreos if i'm like <laughs> i said before i never eat treats but i actually do occasionally like maybe you know once every six months i have some oreos <laughs> yeah um with the the guests that you've had on what are some of your uh what are some of the things that you've taken from from the guests as far as like insights or new thoughts uh interesting ideas does anything stand out Hmm. well every time i have a conversation i learn something new for sure um a new way of looking at something i suppose i really really i'm a when i research something i research it to like the end of the line if possible um so i had really spent the copywriter in yet yeah yeah exactly (laughs) yeah so i think the two years before i um you know actually started doing this i knew a lot about um why to be vegan in fact i got to the point where i was like there's actually no reason not to be like unless we talk about you know taste tradition um like habit Mm -hmm. those types of things but those aren't really good reasons because we did a lot of things in the past out of habit out of tradition that weren't positive so um there's really yeah i i I got to the point where i didn't have a reason not to be vegan um and also whole food plant-based i kind of think of them as two separate things really but Mm -hmm. even though they work perfectly together um Mm -hmm. but yeah, in terms of the, the insights, um, like every guest, like I'd learn something new from every guest for sure. Um, maybe not in terms of like, maybe not the bigger things, but, but smaller things in terms of like, for example, um, Alexandra Anderson from five second or five sec health, it's called. Um, she has this, you know, huge following and, um, she's, I suppose I would think of her as almost like a vegan food activist. You know, she doesn't talk Mm. about the ethical side of things, but she really um, tells you how you can eat a whole food plant-based diet. She's got an app and all these different things, and she's a really great person. And she was, I think she was my first guest. Um, And her whole thing was just give, give, give in terms of what you're doing. Like if you're wanting to start a platform or if you're wanting to be part of a movement, it's all about giving. And she is very like that. Like she'll respond to every message that she gets. Like I'd previously DM'd her through Instagram and she'd responded. I was like, oh, wow, I didn't expect her to respond. And, um, and she's, yeah, she's really giving in that way. And I think so many of the guests have that same philosophy in terms of just give this information out, like kind of be the best you can be. Um, and ultimately, we'll, you know, let people make their own decisions. But I think I've learned a lot from the people who've been really successful in this space is to just be as giving as you can. That's probably the biggest takeaway. It's interesting because it's not really mm-hmm. specific to the the plant-based movement, but I think overall that's what I've learned from, from other people. I feel like it, it is, it might be a little bit, um, you know, not front and center in the plant-based movement, but I, I, I get a sense from you, the way you speak about, um, what you value in talking about a plant-based lifestyle, Mm -hmm. talking about the vegan movement is, uh, is opening giving giving people the opportunity to see mm-hmm. what is out there for you know opening them to a new paradigm of mm-hmm. how they could live whether that's for their health whether that's for the environment whether that's for ethics all three but not forcing it upon them just having a conversation mm-hmm. and and like to that idea of giving right giving information to those who are interested in learning more about it and Alexandra, you said was her name? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Alexandra uh, being given in that way, you know, giving mm. recipes away or, or just mm. allowing people to see tasty meals that can help mm. them live a life that they want to live or, mm-hmm. you know, be it in a healthier body is an opportunity for them to look at a way of living that is also compassionate, is also environmentally mm. friendly without them feeling turned off by someone telling them that they have to do it, you know, saying mm. that you have to because of the environment, you have to because of your impacts in, on, um, on animals. That's what I get a sense from you as well as like this inviting mm. way of offering people who are 
who have that glimmer of interest to expand on that by hearing conversations with people who, as you said, are very giving. Yeah, I, um, that's definitely the aim is to have it be an, uh, like an access point for people. So sometimes I say at the start of the podcast, you know, um, I don't mind what diet you eat. Like literally if you're a carnivore, you're welcome to have this conversation because I'm not better than anybody else. Just as like you, you know, we talked about when you were on, on the show, like you used to work at a butcher's shop. Um, <laughs> you know, like we're not mm -hmm. p perfect, um, but we've s seen enough information and we've recognized that our values align with, with this and our health and all the other things. So, but, but if we weren't exposed to that information, maybe the, the change wouldn't happen. I don't know. You know, you never really mm -hmm. know. I mean, some people are, you know, genuinely, I had a conversation, my last podcast, actually I'm launching it soon. Um, it was with a, um, a guy here on the Gold Coast who's been vegan for 41 years. And I was saying, that's incredible. Wow. That's so amazing. 41 right. years. Yes. Yes. Wow. Since he was 16. And, but that's he amazing. said, <laughs> right. That's what I thought. But then he said, oh, actually I have a friend in Sydney who's been um, vegan for 64 years from literally from like, as she was a child, she said, wow. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to eat animals. So it's but funny because as a, as a child, she a made that decision. As a child, she made that decision. Wow. She refused to eat those products. Presumably she didn't um, understand why, but she had like an aversion to all of those products. And then growing up, she yeah. realized like, I don't want to eat animals. Yeah. I actually wow. had someone else on the podcast who became vegetarian at four. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> and, and of their own volition, like they decided yeah. that they wanted to be. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. These are personal decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Not like a being raised vegan, um, but actually yeah. saying, um, that, that person said, um, that was Amanda Darks and she said, um, she also lives on the Gold Coast and she said, um, is the chicken that we're eating here, you know, the same as the chicken, the animal, she'd obviously learn about chickens. And then the mom, her mum said, yeah. And she said, okay, well, no, that's, you know, I'm not going to be eating it. So it's funny because some people have that, I think we all have built in compassion, but some people make that link really soon, but mm -hmm. you know, that wasn't the case for me. It wasn't the case for you. And for 90% of the people that I ever speak to whether just you know in passing or um on the podcast or whatever you know um when we're, we're not perfect and in many ways i think we're fair to lie but it's really interesting actually because you know i grew up on um originally i think it was a goat farm and then it was a sheep farm and then um we shifted and it was a trying to think a sheep and cattle farm anyway so two farms essentially with different animals on there and you know I n knew what was happening to the animals um and while I had conflict I it didn't make me go vegan or um vegetarian I was pescatarian at one point um but not consistently and I also worked on a dairy farm and I knew that the calves were taken from the mothers I actually never saw it happen and I wonder if that would have really impacted me because I did mm -hmm. see the cows. I had that impression that I think so many of us have of milk is that the cows are in the grassy paddock. They come in to be milked. You literally can scratch them under their chin. They're so friendly that like, this is what the biggest thing about animals is they're so innocent. They really mm. trust us. They, it's funny. Some vegans recently were saying to me, you know, oh, animals, you know, often come up to me. I think that they know that, you know, I'm, I'm vegan, you know, I can, mm like pat them or whatever but I was like actually I don't think that I didn't say this to them I was like yeah that's a nice, nice idea <laughs> but I actually don't think that's true because mm -hmm. growing up on a farm you realize that they trust you um yeah. you know they they really um become fond of you and you become fond mm -hmm. of them and when people farmers say they love their animals I don't D disbelieve them they, they actually do and most farmers are not going to go out of the way to hurt animals it's that kind of mm -hmm. last thing where they put them into the yards at the front and the truck comes and they go on the truck and that's just kind of like mm -hmm. I don't want to think about what happens now but whilst you're on the farm generally speaking and certainly the farms that I that I worked on you know the, the you're not doing anything to harm them and you you know we often would scratch the um, cattle under the chin and they they love it you know like the top of the head like like you can do with the horse it's, the, it's they're very similar and um so I think understanding that I had a lot of information but I still didn't make the change and I ate animal products for let's say, probably 27 years of my life it you know I'm not now perfect because I'm vegan because I have the vegan label um and 
yeah, just trying to be as open and welcoming as possible because that's what worked for me. But I actually haven't mm. like, I didn't immediately get to this point. I should say that for anyone who's listening, who's like vegan and so frustrated with the world, I do sometimes get frustrated and I have to not um, watch too much of the sort of animal, um, mm-hmm. the animal ethics side of things because I'm already vegan. I feel like I don't have to expose myself to it. I do sometimes watch talks because they really inspire me to be better at what I do. Um, but um, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> you, Sorry, I have to cut the, <laughs> No, no, no. We were, you, were, you, were, you were talking about how uh, oh, yeah, not you, perfect. You, you take a very open and inviting approach to... Yes. Like, and you, you understand. Mm. Uh, it sounds mm. like where you're going was at the start when you first adopted this. Maybe you... You didn't. You weren't as inviting, or yeah, I don't know. Exactly. I'm not sure where you're going. Thank with that, you. But, uh, no, you're you're yeah. bang on. Yeah. So when I first started um, with this, I didn't feel that way because I had just recently seen what was happening in slaughterhouses, and I was following mm-hmm. a number of vegan activists who I think are so powerful. I think what they do is amazing. They, you know, we can't keep having this movement without them. Um, but I, yeah, I did feel really frustrated, and my husband at the time wasn't vegan, and that really frustrated me when I got to a point of just realizing that I control myself and that I just mm-hmm. make my decisions and I just do my best, then it was so funny because it seemed like everyone around me started to be more interested in it. And most mm-hmm. of the people around me, oh, my close family are certainly plant-based. Um, my husband's probably about 98% vegan. He'll have things with a small amount of animal products in it, but um, when certainly not like ever eating meat at home or anything like that. But I, I've got into a place where I just don't judge people for making decisions, and I don't feel affected mm-hmm. by it anymore. I occasionally do feel affected by what's happening um, in the slaughterhouses, and I have to just focus on the type of world that we want. That's really my aim: is to talk about the plant-based movement to talk about how healthy and inviting it can be, um, how good Mm -hmm. it feels, because it does feel good. A lot of people think that when you go vegan, your, you know, your life's going to be really angry and sad and you're not going to be healthy. Mm -hmm. That's just not true. Like Mm -hmm. (laughs) we're all thriving vegans and I speak to thriving vegans every day, whether on the podcast or just, you know, there's lots of vegan events here on the coast. And, um, everyone's healthy and happy and loves their lives and, it's that, as you said, taking the blinders off. It's just saying, hey, there's, a, there's another world out here and we'd love for you to join us. But no pressure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, the, <laughs> that idea of like the, the pissed off vegan, you know, the yeah. just always upset. I'm sure that exists. And I've met a few. But, uh, <laughs> but, but for the most part, like, you know, Every uh, one of my favorite things ever is like discovering a new vegan joint with friends. It's just fun to, and then you get to see, oh, how are they making this food? Or maybe they have an entirely different type of food that they're making. It's just this, like this exploratory process. Mm. I know it's, it's centering around food, but, um, it is, uh, it is a very enjoyable life. And there is a little bit of pain, like you say, like, um, Sometimes you can find yourself getting sucked into the negative side that is one of the primary reasons why you're a vegan, whether it's mm. for health or environment or, you know, if, if it's the health of a, a friend or a loved one who you wish would be vegan because you know that they would have a huge impact in a good way mm. on whatever ailments you're suffering from. Or if it's the environment, you see what's going on around you. Mm. And you want to see change, you know how easy the change could be if people just made different decisions on their plate. Or if it's animal welfare, if you wish that people would make the connection with cows and pigs that they are with their own dog or their, their cat. Mm. Um, that can be, you know, it can be really challenging if you focus on that. But like you say, there's mm. so much positive focus on as well. And it can be a very positive existence if you look to... Like I don't watch slaughterhouse videos because, like you say, I'm I've yeah. made the decision. It's not something I need to watch. I, sh- I sure as heck reinforce my decision by watching like happy cow videos, <laughs> or like yeah. you know just like seeing um, sanctuary animals acting like puppies, acting like your you know your your dog at home. Um, oh yeah. So I'm just, I'm, I'm happy that you brought that up because it, it is, a, it, for the, everybody that, most people that I've met who have been vegan for a long time, it is, once you get past that initial stage of just 
being upset because you're, you're, you're coming to terms with this paradigm shift for yourself mm -hmm. and wishing that people would have the same paradigm shift because of the reasons you're having it. Yeah. Once you get past that initial stage, there is a, a whole wide world of happiness to experience. Totally. Yeah. It is actually a really beautiful way to live. And I, I was talking about this recently that besides all of the practical things, it feels, I remember when I first went vegan, maybe about two months in, I just felt like as though I walked more lightly on the earth. That's the only way I can describe it. It's almost a feeling that I can't put into words. It's like a feeling of being connected. And mm -hmm. I know for some people that just feels really abstract. So the practical things of like, I often say like, I lost this much weight or this is how much more energy I have or whatever. Um, those practical things tend to be more effective for people to understand the change. But actually the internal feeling of aligning your actions with your values is it's just I can't really describe it but it just feels a whole lot better and it feels more fulfilling that that you yeah I suppose are having a meaningful impact on the world and that you just are more you know I feel like I can kind of look an animal in the eye and not mm. feel subconsciously guilty I didn't know I was feeling guilty before but I am um, I don't feel guilty anymore. I enjoy cooking. I didn't enjoy cooking before, but I didn't know why. But subconsciously, I think I had mixed feelings about what I was doing. And I, underneath it all, knew ultimately that it, it didn't align with my values. And yeah, it's a really beautiful existence. I mean, that's, you know, the whole thing of starting the podcast, presumably why you do this. And, you know, we just want to spread the message because, yeah, what a, what a planet we could live on if we lived on a mostly plant-based planet, let's say. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And, and I love that idea of the fact that you said mostly plant-based because, mm. you know, if, if we're dealing with 8 billion people, 9 billion people, 10 billion people, the likelihood mm. of everybody going vegan is pretty low. Yeah. But the likelihood of people eating more plant-based is very high. Mm. And the more people, the more people who eat even a percent more plants than they would have, um, makes a huge impact globally as far as how many animals are being domesticated for, for consumption and the environmental impact as well. So if this person cuts out 10% meat, this person cuts, cuts out 30% meat, whatever it ends up being over the, over the long term as that transition happens, you know, more and more people go more and more plant-based. The environmental impacts, the animal husbandry impact, it's, it's, it'd, be, it'd be massive and exponential. Hmm. Um, I'd be interested to, to, so you, you shared a little bit about your experience growing up in New Zealand and being hmm. on a farm and it, hmm. New Zealand's huge for farming, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Right. That's Especially for correct. like, yeah. Hmm. So, so when you look back on your time on the farm and I'm, I'm sure that you still have friends or family members mm -hmm. that are in the farm life. Yeah. What, how would you describe your thought processes back then? Like, the, what, what was the world that you lived in back then? And what are some of the, what are some of the avenues that if you were going to, let's say that you went back in time and you're going to speak to yourself working at mm. the farm, right? What are some of the avenues that would be the most inviting for that person to start to have these conversations in, in their head to have these questions and look for answers to those questions how would you how would you start that whole thing off hmm that's such an interesting question I mean as you say New Zealand is huge for farming um, mm. our biggest exports are in the animal agriculture industry so my optimism for the plant-based movement I'm much let's just say I'm much more optimistic for other parts of the world to move the, the movement forward um, than I am about New Zealand because mm -hmm. basically our country runs off ultimately the exploitation of animals. Um, right. So, yeah, that's a difficult, um, yeah, a difficult hurdle to overcome, but I hope that mm -hmm. because the movement is, it's happening so fast in other parts of the world and it is happening in New Zealand, actually, the, vegans are the number of vegans are still rising in New Zealand so I think um 
you know, it will eventually move and hopefully we can see that actually this land can be used for plant-based purposes. And, you know, I say we because I'm still a New Zealander even though I live in Australia. But, um, you know, we could be like, the, you know, the, we, we have this perception of being clean and green, which is to an extent true, but actually not really because our waterways are polluted by the dairy industry. So... Mm. Um, if we were to live up to that clean green image, that'd be so beautiful. But as you say, um, yeah, growing up um, on farms, I have very mixed opinions about. I, in some ways, I find it difficult to talk about because, as you say, I have a lot of friends who still work in the dairy industry and on different farms. And so, like, for example, we had a um, last March, we had a vegan wedding or well, it was, yeah, plant based wedding, let's That's say. That's cool. Yeah, it was, it was really incredible. We Your actually, wedding? Yes. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's uh, awesome. Yeah. So, um, when we first booked it in, I was just sort of early days vegan and it, I wasn't concerned. I was just hoping that they would give me a vegan meal. Um, and my mum as well, because she was, um, going vegan at around the same time. But by the time it rolled around to the wedding, I mean, most of my very close family were mostly plant based or fully plant based. Oh, wow. And we had a number of vegans at the wedding, but we also had a number of dairy farmers like, um, yeah, heaps of farmers were at the wedding actually. And like, the thing is you can not like something without not liking the person. You can still love someone mm. even if oh, you, they don't do things that you agree with. Um, so yeah, it was interesting to kind of have that, like that mix of like having a fully vegan wedding and actually people who, you know, a lot of farmers came up and said, Oh, the food was excellent. That was amazing. We'd never had vegan cheese before. Like that was so exciting. And they actually really did, did a really mm. good job. But, um, yeah, so going back to the farming, I have such mixed views about it. Um, it was such an idyllic upbringing. You know, it's like rolling hills. You get to be around mm. animals. I loved animals. Um, I would say that, you know, in terms of farming, it was ethical farming because we didn't go out of our way to harm the animals or anything. Mm. Um, generally speaking, it felt really compassionate. And, um, you know, occasionally if there was a, a lamb that didn't have a mother because, say, the mother died or the mother rejected the lamb or something like that, uh, sometimes because the paddocks are big, you know, they can get mixed up on whose lamb. And my mum would always put so much effort into making sure that every lamb had a mother because you have, like, hundreds of um, lambs, you know. It can be quite stressful <laughs> to, to make sure they're all mothered. And, you know, that compassion you know, that, that mm -hmm. is, is stressful. You know, if um, a, a sheep had fly strike and um, they were, my dad would share the sheep. And if one of the sheep had fly strike, he would go over the night before and make sure it was shorn because he didn't want um, the sheep to be uncomfortable. For people who don't know what fly strike is, it's basically like it can actually lead to death. It's when flies like land on the um, the sheep. And anyway, it's not very nice. We don't need to get into the details. But he, um, you That's know, so there's little like things of compassion. And we certainly, mm. there wasn't a lot of killing on the farm. But there are things that I remember when, um, like I remember when I... Um, uh, a steer got, which is a, basically a male cow. Um, he, not a bull though, but anyway. <laughs> they basically raised for, for beef. And he um, fell in the creek, broke his leg, and anyway, basically couldn't mm. be saved. And my dad had to, to shoot it. And I, I remember being really traumatized by that. I mean, I still remember it. I remember other animals having to be killed for various reasons, and I really, really didn't like it. To answer your question, a very long way of answering your question, but to answer your question, I suppose the way that I would start to like sort of show what, what's really happening is to actually see the whole process. Because what happens is we all see a small process and people probably think, but you, you actually worked on a dairy farm. You must know what was happening. And it, I kind of think I almost knew what was happening to the extent that everyday people know what's happening. Um, we know that if we're taking milk from a cow, the calf can't have the milk. And I never saw a calf being killed um, or taken. So I, I think if I'd just seen the whole process, including the slaughterhouse, mm. people who say I visited a slaughterhouse once and then that, that was the trigger for me. I think, you know, there's a reason that we don't have school trips to slaughterhouses. You know, but they do yeah. do school trips to, to, to other things. You know, we learn about everything else, but we don't learn about how our food... Even might, might even go to the farm where the yeah. cows are going to be yeah. eventually and taken you, to the slaughterhouse. Exactly. And you hand feed the... It's like a, mm. you know, those petting zoos and you can actually like feed mm. the 
the sheep and the kids are like oh they're so cute it's like yeah do you realize that this is what happens and people kind of want to protect them from all that information it's like well don't tell them that that's what happens it's like well yes we need to we have that more information so i think it would be just seeing the whole process because Mm -hmm. i think if i'd ever visited a slaughterhouse if i'd been on the truck with the the um lambs going to the slaughterhouse seeing the whole process then i think this would have happened a lot sooner I also think it's important to have the health aspect as well because you don't want to think, oh, I should go vegan, but I'm going to have poor health. And we don't want poor health vegans because they'll tend to not stay vegan for very long. Mm -hmm, And you can mm -hmm. definitely be a vegan that isn't healthy. Um, So the health part of it is really important. And as you know, and you've mentioned that environmental side, but I think just seeing the whole process, like, you you know, you worked Mm -hmm. in a butcher shop, right? But you weren't seeing the animal. I don't know if this is true, but you didn't see the animals be killed, right? No, just the parts. Yeah, and it's like at that point, uh, it's not an animal anymore. People see it as something different. Well, yeah, I mean, it's funny as you say that. I, I, I mean, I, I think I've had this thought in my mind, but it was just it wasn't uh, it was just a foggy idea. It wasn't actually, um, you know, condensed down into an actual thought. Mm-hmm. When I was in a when I worked in a, the butcher shop, I was just dealing with pieces of an animal and Mm -hmm. um like you say i i didn't i didn't know the whole process i didn't know i I don't even think i'd ever given thought to a slaughterhouse at that point in my life Mm -hmm. and then um for me i remember the day that i realized that these were animals you know i didn't even have that like i like i knew that they were animals Mm -hmm. but i didn't i didn't know that they were animals you know like Mm -hmm. i didn't make that connection that this was once a living being and um and so, so like you say, if I had, if I had seen the whole process, if I had seen and the whole process from right from the conception, not the conception, but the, the birth of a, a calf mm-hmm. and it growing up and, and seeing that it had a life to live, that it had a, a, um, a mind of its own, it, it, it like it, something that you said at the, in the middle of the, of the podcast, which I is so, I think it's so important for people to see is that animals you said animals trust us Mm -hmm. which is like that that's it's really uh, it's it's kind of heart-wrenching because we betray that trust on a factory farmed on a factory uh Mm. wide scale and um from if i had seen that process of a calf being birthed and then growing up and and having that empathy as a, for, for other creatures, all of the creatures, whether it's a cow, whether, whether it's another mm-hmm. cow, whether it's a pig, a chicken, uh, myself, mm-hmm. you know, another human being, there's no way at all that I would have got into being a butcher shop and working in a butcher shop because, mm-hmm. um, I would have made that connection between what is on the chopping block and where it came from. Yeah. So I just really appreciate you brought that up. Mm, yeah. It's, it's important to, they talk about this a lot in the you know vegan community is making the connection but it's so hard for people because if you don't see any mm. of the process and like we've literally been part of the animal industry i mean everyone has if you eat animal products you're part of the the process but we've specifically mm. worked in um parts of the process and still felt like when we discovered you know all the information we still felt a little bit like huh i didn't know this so mm. yeah it's really interesting sorry there's a hopefully that truck isn't too loud no, no, it's fine. Okay. It's fine. <laughs> I think it's like a Like I say, it adds ambience. Okay, good. It sounds all tropical and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the birds. <laughs> That's great. They're actually just magpies. <laughs> it's nothing special. <laughs> <laughs> um, Still animals, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, 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 those are the... Those mm-hmm. animals are compassionate. Uh, what is it? Eight or nine months out of the year and then those you know those few months where they're protecting their nests <laughs> the magpies go crazy at least at least um that's been my experience with their their counterpart up here crows because they uh oh yeah they'll we swoop and dive bomb well. you and yeah yeah they're terrifying yeah, yeah they if they look yeah. at you i'm like please don't hurt me <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah well uh chloe i appreciate your time today um i really appreciate what you're doing too with your podcast the fact that you are opening up these conversations between your listeners and the people who have, like you say, they're, they're, they're giving, you know, they're giving in their knowledge or they're giving in their uh, insights into how a plant-based diet can help your mm-hmm. listeners 
achieve a better life and, and, uh, for themselves and the people and animals that they share the planet with mm. for people listening here, I'll, you know, I'll put all the show in the show notes where they can find you and how they can mm. listen to your podcast. If there was someone listening to this conversation right now, and they were like you were when you realized that a plant-based, you were just starting to make this connection between plant-based life mm. and how it could help you with your health and the, the predicaments that you found yourself in. But they're, they're just like you were caught up in the momentum of their previous life, of their previous diet. What would be a suggestion? What would you say to that person? Well, I would say, you know, it's always worth just giving it a go. Um, and being really kind to yourself you know the whole thing about veganism is kindness but you've got to start with yourself and you know it's okay if you don't feel in a position to go vegan right now even if you're slightly interested in it it's very much okay to take some more time and think about it and you know one way to just I suppose dip your toe in the water and just see if it's for you is just to start making more plant-based meals I think that's such an obvious way because I think the food although the food isn't the end you know there's animal products in terms of what we wear and what we use and um, animals for entertainment and a lot of other things that might come later but I think the food is just a really great starting point because you know you're affecting your health the environment and the animals so you know and that's how I started is just searching plant-based recipes you know you might have a partner or children or whoever who don't are, aren't interested in this but you could just veganize the odd meal and see how it goes you know maybe you start you know a few times a week and just thinking about um you know maybe you have a favorite food and so you could literally just google you know the plant-based version of that food that's mm-hmm. that's such an easy um access point and that's exactly what i did just to realize oh okay i can do this you know mm-hmm. the office christmas party might not be the best time to do it because everyone else is eating the food <laughs> you're hungry yeah. you know and you don't yeah. want to be like getting into a discussion with yeah. you know so and so from accounts about like the keto yeah. diet that they're on you know you don't need that pressure at the <laughs> <Yeah>. start <laughs> you yeah, know just yeah, in your totally. own time when you can choose what you're eating start thinking about that maybe go to a, a vegan restaurant because then you'll really see like how amazing vegan food can be and um yeah just start making little steps and then over time you'll probably have more confidence in it um sometimes it's best not to tell people um particularly using the word vegan if you feel like you're going to be mm. under pressure or asked a ton of questions you could just say oh, i'm eating switching towards plant-based or i'm trying vegetarian meals for a while like things that aren't as um what's the word just that aren't going to kind of put you under a spotlight because it's a lot of pressure yeah. you know probably yeah. you and i have got to a point where we don't feel the, the pressure yeah. anymore but at the start yeah. it, it does feel a little confronting so i think taking baby steps being kind to yourself being okay with the fact that you had a vegan burger today but then tomorrow you had a steak that's fine just mm. just don't worry don't feel like it's the end just keep making those small steps and in time um you might find that it's actually really easy i would also you know look at you know resources like nutritionfacts.org i think that's one of the best to mm. sort of learn about the health side and why it is better because i think if you don't have that part of it um you might tend away from it so I think that's important so continue to educate yourself but just treat it as a gradual process is my advice (laughs) I love it well Chloe thank you so much for being on my podcast yes thank you I was looking forward to it because I in my conversation with you I knew that there was a story that I wanted to learn just selfishly (laughs) about you and how you got to where you are and I'm so happy that we were able to have that conversation here today oh good thank you it's a real honor to be on the um the podcast this is the first podcast I've been on that isn't my own podcast and um, oh, it's a real thrill and I really appreciate what you do and spreading the message and you know going at it from like a, a fitness perspective as well and learning more about you and recognizing you know like you know you speaking about being compassionate to yourself and all these really amazing principles that we don't always associate with people who are lifting weights you know which is such a stereotype <laughs> and it's yeah. great that you're kind of breaking down those walls and, and doing what you do so it's fantastic. I appreciate you. Well, thanks so much, Chloe. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you again for checking out this episode of the Power Plant Body Podcast. 
If you enjoyed it, I'd be grateful if you left it a rating and review on iTunes. When you leave a rating and review, it helps because it lets iTunes know and they'll be more likely to promote it to others who could also benefit from hearing these conversations. You can feel free to share this episode with people who could also benefit from Chloe's insights into the ethics and benefits of the vegan diet. Make sure you head over to Instagram and give Chloe a follow. Her Instagram handle is at plantypotty. That's at P-L-A-N-T-Y-P-O-D-I-E. And subscribe to her podcast on iTunes so that you can stay up to date with all of the insightful conversations that she's having with vegan doctors and influencers. That's the Planty Potty Podcast. Don't forget to head over to powerplantbody.com forward slash free tools to get your hands on a free copy of the Goal Wheel PDF, along with tons of other free tools. I'm regularly adding new resources to that page to help you create the best version of yourself, so you'll definitely want to bookmark it. You can find me on Instagram, at the vegan trainer. that's at T-H-E-V-E-G-A-N-T-R-A-I-N-E-R, and feel free to send me a DM if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes. Thanks again for spending some time with Chloe and I today. I'll see you in the next episode.